In May of 1997, an IBM supercomputer named Deep Blue made headlines all around the world for winning a six-game series against the greatest chess player in the world at the time, Garry Kasparov. This was considered to be the moment when computers officially became better than humans at chess. Of course, it's a lot more complicated than that. Computers have actually been beating humans at various levels of chess since the 1960s, and there's lots of different kinds of chess. In fact, Deep Blue beat Kasparov a year earlier in a match, but Kasparov managed to win the six-game series. Now, whether or not there was a singular moment where computers became the chess masters of the world, that doesn't matter. What does matter is that they have officially become better at chess than we have. In fact, in 2009, a computer called Pocket Fritz 4 uh, was able to outdo Deep Blue off of a cell phone. And it's been 10 years since then, so computers are basically unbeatable at chess at this point. And in 2017, Google DeepMind's computer AlphaGo beat the world's greatest Go player, KG. And this is actually a little more impressive because Go is a game that's very improvisational. You kind of make it up as you go along. And its successor, AlphaZero, actually trains itself how to play the game. And it was able to win 60 out of 100 matches after only 34 hours of training. Today, it's considered the best Go player in the world and is basically unbeatable. AI is shaking up a lot of industries, but maybe none more so than gaming and sports. And not in all the ways you might expect. Sports are just steeped in tradition and superstition, and perhaps no sport more so than baseball, with their seventh inning stretch, with their tossing out of the you know, inaugural pitch, with their singing of take me out to the ball game, and knickers. They still wear knickers for crying out loud. And the same is true for how they scout players in the major leagues. I mean, yes, yeah, stats matter, but also they weigh in things like how good their swing is and you know what kind of running stance they have and their game face. That kid's got moxie. All of that changed in 2002. Billy Bean, the general manager of the Oakland A's, was facing the possibility of another losing season, especially after losing some of his biggest players, having them poached away by richer teams. He had to find a way to build a winning team with a fraction of the budget the bigger teams had. For example, he had a $44 million salary budget, whereas the Yankees had $125 million to play with. And with nothing to lose, he threw all the rules out the window. And instead of relying on things like batting averages and RBIs, he's decided to focus all of his analytical skills towards one thing only, getting on base. And by focusing only on getting on base, he was able to comb through lists of players and find valuable players that were undervalued by the rest of the league and got them for super cheap. All of this was documented in the book Moneyball in the 2011 movie of the same name. The bottom line is they focused on data and analytics instead of the traditional metrics that scouts have been using for over 100 years. And this idea worked. That year, not only did the A's finish first in their division, but they had a 20-game winning streak that broke all kinds of league records. This particular analytical approach was what was known as sabermetrics, and it was nothing new. It had been around for a long time, but this, this all-in approach that the A's took was new and unique and became the norm throughout the baseball league. Within the next year, nine different teams had hired sabermetrics analysts to help you know, grow and build their teams. Today, not just baseball, but all professional teams use this kind of approach to decision making, but now it's guided by AI. AI has the ability to crunch massive amounts of data and make recommendations without any kind of human bias whatsoever. It can take historical data and then predict what kind of performance these players will get from that data, and then it can analyze the real-time performance of these players to determine whether or not it was accurate and become more accurate in the future. And AI is also being used to keep players more healthy and injury free. Players regularly undergo physical tests that use AI to measure their health metrics and determine whether or not they could predict, you know, physical problems, fatigue, stress, joint wearing out, that kind of thing. And some teams are even putting wearable technology on their players so that AI can monitor them in the heat of competition. This isn't just good for the players by keeping them from getting hurt, but it also protects the investment that the teams make in these players. AI is also being used to evaluate players' performance. It can evaluate what are high risk and low risk shots, evaluate what the player's strengths and weaknesses are, where they need to work on things, and improve to become better players. And it can also find patterns that human eyes just can't catch. A company called Second Spectrum has created software that analyzes basketball players' performance in real time to develop new game strategies based purely on data. In fact, professional sports is kind of becoming a competition between AIs with humans just pawns in their little game. That just got dark. But hey, why stop there? Why not let an AI make up an entire game of its own? Just on a whim, the design agency AKQA decided to feed an AI the uh, rules and regulations for 400 different sports to see what kind of sport it could come up with. And what it came up with 
was Speedgate. The game is played on a field with three gates, two on the end and one in the center. Each team is made up of six players, three forwards, and three defenders. Goals are scored by kicking the ball between the end gates from either direction. You must pass the ball from below the waist, and you must kick the ball through the gates to score. If you perform a ricochet move, meaning you kick the ball to a teammate who kicks it out of the air through the gate, it counts as three points. But don't cross a center gate or your team will lose possession. If some of these rules seem weird and hard to follow, just be glad they didn't go with some of the earlier iterations that the AI came up with. Uh, exploding frisbees were involved. Actually, no, I want to see that. The AI even came up with a slogan for the game. Face the ball, to be the ball, to be above the ball. <laughs> Tight. The sport was created as an exercise for uh, Design Week, but the company is actually looking into creating intramural leagues around this. They're talking to different sports retailers to stock their stores with equipment for this. So uh, who knows, maybe someday you'll get a chance to be above the ball yourself. But perhaps the most interesting mix of AI and sports is the one that has the most potential to change the world outside of that sport. And for that, I gotta talk about Robo Race. Robo Race is the first fully autonomous auto racing league. Started as something as a spin off of Formula E, the all electric racing league, Robo Race takes it a step further and removes the driver, putting AI in the driver's seat. Just like NASCAR and Formula One have standardized cars that put all the teams on a level playing field, Robo Race developed a high performance autonomous racing car currently named DevBot 2. It features a suite of sensors and onboard autonomous computers powered by NVIDIA chips that the teams then use to train to race each other totally autonomously. A future car in development is named Robocar, and it's designed by Daniel Simon, an art director for Hollywood films such as Tron Legacy, Oblivion, and Captain America. It all started with Daniel Svidlov, our founder, and we were uh, collaborating with Formula E. And coming back from a Hong Kong event, uh, Daniel was talking to uh, the Agar, and the, the founder of the Formula E. And uh, he just came out with this crazy idea of autonomous cars racing uh, against each other. Robo Race actually started out with human drivers to sort of train the AI in the cars to learn how to do the certain things that they have to do. Um, they're actually going out now with their fully autonomous version. It's called Season Alpha, and they're gonna be going to Spain, the UK, the United States, and all over the world. And the goal is to use this as a catalyst to spur innovation in the field of autonomous driving. Because racing cars creates a multitude of high-level autonomous AI uh, situations, this kind of stuff can transfer over to the real world. We used a human driver to push the car to its limit, to show AI where the limits are. We can use that data to feed AI algorithms to show where, where the limits of the car are. Now we, we improve DevBot from just a development vehicle into the, the, the real race car. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, we're mixing humans with the AI on the racetrack. We are experimenting with formats, we're experimenting with, with race format, with the challenges we give to the humans. So mm -hmm. there was a lot of ideas how we can pitch human and the, and the uh, AI algorithms and the autonomous driver against each other. And some developers working on robo race teams want to see a future of the sport where they actually develop autonomous AI personalities that people can cheer for, people, uh, AI drivers that have certain styles of driving that, that people can, can kind of get behind like it's a real person. Maybe some autonomous cars drive you know, more aggressively than others, maybe crashing becomes an actual tactic they can use because there's no humans that can get hurt in the process. Driverless cars can take more risks than cars with people in them and who knows, maybe someday in the far future we'll look back at a time when humans were actually in those cars speeding around the track and they'll think that's barbaric that people put their lives on the line. I mean, people have actually died many times on the track. Hardcore NASCAR fans have just thrown their computer out the window at this point. The fact of the matter is competition has always spurred innovation and advancement. It's true of capitalism, it's true of warfare. And projects like Robo Race are a way of using that competitive spirit to spur innovations that can move our society forward and eventually make our streets safer. I want to thank Mirek for taking time to talk to me about Robo Race, and I want to thank Robo Race for sponsoring this video. If you want to find out more about Robo Race, you can go to their website, roborace.com, or uh, I can link to their YouTube channel right here. They got a ton of really cool videos, and actually, I've got links to some playlists to get you started right down there in the description. Hey, thanks a lot for watching. If this is your first time here, I invite you to check out any of the other videos of mine that YouTube might be suggesting for you. I talk about fun future and technology stuff uh, every Monday and Thursday. And if you like them, I invite you to subscribe. You'll be the first to see them. 
All right, that's enough for now. You guys go out, have an eye-opening rest of the week, and I'll see you on Monday. Love you guys. Take care.